The high grasslands of the Western Ghats are the home of the Nilgiri Tar. The Irvikulam National Park is the main center where these tars graze, moving blithely over almost vertical rock formations. The lion-tailed macaque is an extremely rare animal of the Western Ghat region. These animals use a vast region of the evergreen ecosystem for food gathering. Precisely for that reason, the destruction of the ecosystem has taken these mammalian species to the edge of extinction. Monkeys are the ancestors of humans. There are 11 species of apes, monkeys and lemurs in India. The Sundarbans, one of the most fertile ecosystems in India, is the main center for the rhesus monkeys. Enriched by the organic matter brought by the Himalayan rivers, the Sundarbans forms the world's largest river delta, an organic chain that includes mudskippers that roll in the dirt, crab species that help combine biomass with soil, turtles, water monitors, king cobras, and deers. At the top of this food pyramid reigns the crocodile in the estuary and the tiger on land. The destruction of biodiversity continues even as conservation measures become active. 15 million hectares of tropical forests are destroyed each year. 20,000 species disappear. 50 species are lost each day. Several factors contribute to the laws of biodiversity. Dams, once considered the temples of progress, introduction of exotic species, and overexploitation of bioresources. Loss of ecosystems results in the loss of some species. Ex situ measures that conserve them outside their natural habitats play an important role here. It is in this context that botanical gardens and zoological gardens become relevant. Around 12 to 15,000 species have preserved in botanical gardens the world over. The Royal Botanical Garden established by Robert Kidd on the banks of the Hooghly in Kolkata is one of the oldest in the world. Known as the Indian Botanical Garden in post-independence India, the center has a rare collection of plants of economic importance from all over the world. The palm house here maintains 115 species of palms. The Indian Botanical Garden was the first breeding center for exotic species like tea, rubber, and mahogany. The main attraction here is a giant banyan tree that covers half a hectare with a circumference of 420 meters. The Tropical Botanical Garden and Research Institute in Palod, Thiruvananthapuram, has a rare collection of plants from delicate tropical ecosystems. Ferns, wild orchids, bamboo species, figs, wild decorative plants and medicinal plants are conserved in separate conservatories here. The institute has modern facilities for ex situ conservation like a national gene bank, a seed bank and the cryobank. Several endemic medicinal plants like the Decalypsis arealpatra are available in the medicinal garden here. Endemic species like the Edimocarpus fishery and Philanthus gagiana are wild ornamental plants.
40% of the plants in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are endemic. Comparable to the Malaysian forests in the distribution of plant species, 20% of the plant in the Andaman forests are not found in India. The rare Andaman species are protected here. Life is like a book that can never be completely read. The endless fascination of the deep oceans. The tiny worlds of invisible microorganisms. There still remains many living environments which human eyes have not yet seen. Three centuries back, in a Pishnoi village near Jodhpur, 362 villagers led by Amrutha Devi sacrificed their lives to protect their KG trees, leading their lives in accordance with the 29 commandments of their community's guru, Ramboji. The Pishnois continue to maintain a love for the environment as a religious belief. There are parallels in India to the Pishnoi villagers who feed wild animals with their own hands. Sacred groves that are preserved for the sake of religious belief exhibit the same kind of special sense for the preservation of biodiversity. There are sacred groves all over the country, known as Devarkadu in Karnataka, as Nagam and Kavu in Kerala, as Kenkri in Rajasthan, as Devarai in Maharashtra, as Sharana in Bihar. These calves, which are the lungs of the village, are also storehouses of biodiversity. As in the Western Ghats, the species in the calves are also highly endemic. There are three species of medicinal orchid Nervilia in the sacred groves of Kerala. Plants like Gymnostachium, which is a local antidote for viper poison, and Kunzleria keraliensis, which was first identified in the sacred groves of Alapura, are all species confined to the calves. Temple ponds and other holy bathing ghats are also homes to animals like tortoises and fishes. The practice of offering rice and food to tortoise and fish being cured of diseases is still prevalent in many villages in India. Several fishes like the Hora Bagras and Indian Mahasir are being protected as a result of these religious beliefs. Muggers were common in the temple ponds and freshwater lakes of Kerala till about a century back. In Kerala, this endangered reptile remains only in the temple pond of the Anantapuri temple in Kasargod district. Most vegetable dye plants are found in marginal environments and are used by folk performers, artisan communities, weavers, traditional painters and potters. Erosion of diversity has affected these plants too. Owing to this, the living condition of marginal communities have become more miserable.
There is a growing demand for vegetable dyes in view of the adverse environmental and human health impact of synthetic dyes. The ban on acid dyes in textiles by Germany has provided the first incentive to conventional textile exporters to pay attention to vegetable dyes. The use of vegetable dyes is prevalent now in the toy industry as a remedy to the health problems created by artificial dyes. The aborigines of Jamaica used to drink water boiled with leaves of periwinkle as a cure for diabetes. The most powerful drugs available today for leukemia namely wind christine and wind blastin are derived from periwinkle. Several drugs being used in modern medicine like recipin, quinine and aspirin are gifts from traditional knowledge. About 3,000 antibiotics including penicillin, cyclosporin and tetracycline are derived from microorganisms and fungi. The modern health system today looks towards biodiversity for a cure for killer diseases, like AIDS. The hope of the future lies in knowledge handed down from one generation to another, as in Ayurveda and tribal medicine. But the new world economic order, which bestows monopoly rights even over life forms, is beginning to threaten the very existence of traditional knowledge. The medicinal qualities of turmeric and neem, which were patented in the US, were a common property that had behind it the relevance of thousands of years of Indian medicinal signs. When biopiracy becomes widespread and the transparency of the biodiversity convention is lost, we will have to face the challenge of protecting our genetic wealth. The Patuum village in Kannur is a model for this. In a campaign spread over two years, the villagers generated a biodiversity registry through data collection and education. Their declaration of ownership of their biodiversity on April 11, 1997, became a model for the whole world. The confidential nature of traditional knowledge is lost as databases are published. When economic giants enter this area, they never ask permission from the real owners of this knowledge. Neither do they share their profits fairly. There is no clause in the Biodiversity Convention to ensure that they do. It is in the midst of such worries that a biodiversity law which prevents biopiracy ensures a free equity to the owners of the knowledge, protects both agriculture and wild biodiversity is free from loopholes, becomes relevant. The plenitude of biodiversity is one matter, Equity in its application and exploitation is quite another, and that continues to be an area of concern and possible tension.